Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. questions to be dealt with further impertinent debates of Hellenistic philosophy. 
One of the issues that needs to be resolved is to what extent the notion of a therapy of desire is differentiated either from Adam's idea of philosophy as a way of life and from Foucault's care of the self or <coughs> ideas of technique de soi. As said, the reason why I ask these questions here is to use them as tools for my own line of questioning. <coughs> Rather than focusing on the period of late antiquity and on Hellenistic philosophy, I want to focus on the period following it, to zoom in on that blend of philosophical and literary inquiry into the nature of God and the universe, which we commonly designate as Christian, and are trained to approach as theological rather than philosophical. My questions specifically involve that period in Christian thinking which roughly stretches from Augustine in the 4th until Abelard in the 12th century, and which from a philosophical standpoint is seen as largely platonic. But there's a deeper connection than a mere succession of periods inviting comparison. While in her later upheavals of thought, um, the intelligence of emotions, Nussbaum pays explicit attention to a Christian author like Augustine, in Therapy of Desire, she considers him merely a literal Platonist. This evaluation is um, uh, more straightforward and, and unidirectional than Ados, who held that Western thought received its problems, themes, and symbols in the form that was given to them either by Hellenistic thought or by the adaptation of this thought to the Roman world or by the encounter between Hellenism and Christianity. All of this led Addo to focus on contamination rather than influence or reflection as the process according to which paganism or Christianity were led to adopt the ideas or the behaviors characteristic of their adversary. Although my own thoughts go more into the direction of a mutation of cultural patterns than of unidirectional development, Nussbaum's therapy of desire has remained particularly dear to me as I attempt to formulate the deeper problems of early medieval theology, whose moral focus seems there but is rather different in rather different fashion from therapy as a kind of spiritual process involving self-medication and with a role for the patient himself as part of the cure. My interest from a historical standpoint is actually to find out why Christian authors such as Augustine and Anselm did by and large not go down that road. Set off against Nussbaum's subtle and convincing analysis of Hellenistic philosophy, it seems difficult to understand that authors like Augustine and Anselm deliberately chose not to engage their readers in such overt therapeutical strategies. Was their God of mercy not ideally suited for this kind of approach? Comparing their thought to Hellenistic philosophy in a broader Ado-like manner, we do find them interested in the idea of exegitatio mentis, the exercise of the, of the mind, but this is accompanied by an almost casual disregard for ethics. <coughs> Aside from some medical metaphors, with which Augustine refers to himself rather than to his flock, it appears he's not as interested in the process of healing others as he is in strategies of persuading them through a combination of logic and eloquence. And yet, given his structural tendency to associate sinfulness with sickness and conversion with convalescence, is it not true that the period after him could have easily developed in that direction? While that may or may not be true, historically it appears indeed as if Augustine's own mind has a rather different aspect to it than what we're used to highlighting today. And then what we're used to highlighting today, I'm obviously thinking of the confession and so on. One may characterize it as early medieval, following a hint by Henri Irene Marou about Augustine as the first medieval author, seeing its scope as roughly coterminous with the time period in which it occurs. In its more stylized and intensified forms, it can also be called tropological 
even though its impact ranges far beyond the grounds of the average Benedictine <coughs> compound. It is as a result of this tropological turn, so I'm inclined to think, that early medieval Christian theology did not just lack an explicitly ethical or therapeutical interest comparable to the Hellenistic philosophy of late antiquity, but that the Ambrosian interest in ethics, as evidenced in his day of teachings, dissipated. It wasn't until the middle of the first half of the 12th century uh, that some kind of ethical turn in Christian thought did come about. As an example, we may look at Peter Adelard, author of An Ethics. And in his ethics, we find him on the one hand treading new ethical ground, while remaining on the other deeply rooted in the old tropological mindset, as the subtitle of the work, Know Thyself, uh, immediately betrays. But what was the essence of this early medieval tropological mindset, begun by Augustine, uh, if it is not therapeutical in the Hellenistic sense, and if seeing it as executatio mentis may offer too general a paradigm. Let me capture it by working backwards as I reconstruct what happens as a result of the emergence of Abelard's explicitly ethical project. And after that, I will go back to unpack the different layers that are collapsed in the textual production of the Christian early Middle Ages as it seems as if in them, ethics, epistemology, and self-reflection were for a long time held together by an underlying sense of order. Um, and I have a section called Adelar at the end of the tropological term. Adelar is not among the medieval authors one normally associates with medieval Neoplatonism. And yet, just as there is considerably more Augustinianism in Avalar than one would perhaps suspect, there is also more Platonism. This was the result of a continuous tradition of Platonic lore, which stretched roughly from late antiquity, Alcidius, Macrobius, to the 12th century. Its presence colors many early medieval discussions, as it touches both on the nature of the divine and on the perceived inadequacy of human language. The 12th century is precisely the era in which it culminates, and Abelard is among its most crucial representatives because he's a witness not only to its presence, but also to its disappearance. He frequently taps into this platonic material when discussing the problems of the Trinity um, in his theological works. The identification of the world soul with the Holy Spirit is an important example, as is his idea that ultimately theological language involves approximations of the divine rather than dealing with representations of reality, ideas which are likewise found in theor theoreticians like Cherry of Chartres or William of Comte. And yet, when Abelard writes his ethics, he's not engaging his platonic heritage as much as he's tapping into his own monastic background. For contrary to what one might expect, it is the tropological rather than the therapeutical mentality which we encounter when reading the introspective subtitle, Know Thyself. But what brings me to say this? It is, obviously, it is obvious that Abelard is interested in some kind of introspection. But there's a difference between doing so for reasons of self-knowledge in a therapeutic setting or out of the desire, which is Abelard's, to assess human intentionality. Abelard was interested in doing the latter, as we know from other works, likewise scrutinizing human motives, in which he used other strategies, actually, than introspection. From these other works, it is also clear that he had other options available, such as the familiar dialogue format, to explore various eudaimonistic ideals, Jewish, philosophical, and Christian, uh, in his work with that title, The Dialogue Between a Jew, a Philosopher, a Philosopher and a Christian. But his <coughs> ethics opts explicitly for self-knowledge, raising the question why. It may be that the dialogue form for Avalar was useful to teach, and teaching was his main trade, but seemed less suitable to bear his soul. Uh, 
And yet, precisely on that point, there is a great difference with Augustine. And that difference explains kind of the, 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 the whole period in between, in my view. To assess the difference, one way may be to look at the changed notion of confession. In Augustine, confession indicates praise of God, as in the opening lines of the confessions. And I quote, can any praise be worthy of the Lord's majesty? How magnificent his strength, how inscrutable his wisdom. Man is one of your creatures, Lord, and his instinct is to praise you. He bears about him the mark of death, the sign of his own sin, to remind him that you swore to proud. But still, since he is part of your creation, he wishes to praise you. The thought of you stirs him so deeply that he cannot be content unless he praises you because you made us for yourself, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you." End of quote. In Adler's Ethics, on the other hand, we find a much more private notion of confession, as confession of one's sin. I'm not saying that that is not present in Augustine, but I think the more inclusive uh, view of Augustine's confession, which comes down ultimately on the side of praise. Adler states how there are three things that reconcile a sinner to God. Repentance, confession, and satisfaction. Representing a significant moment in seeing the individual moving away from the church, Adler's view of confession is that it may sometimes be omitted. Quoting Ambrose's commentary on Luke, he argues that in the case of the Apostle Peter, who betrayed the Lord, his tears made his confession redundant, which is the reason why we do not read about it in Scripture. It is hard not to associate the biblical Peter with Adler himself, who St. Bernard derided as the self-styled author of a new gospel <coughs> according to Peter. And the personal overtones of this passage for Adler are evident. What I find most interesting, however, is the changed meaning of confession not just from an institutional requirement to a personal need, but rather from a larger inclusion in which God and self were cosmically integrated to a matter of personal discretion and even exclusion. What we are seeing in Adelaar may indeed mark the beginning of a change towards a more ethical, deliberative stance. But what makes the ethics such a fascinating work is that at the same time we're also witness to his remarkable failure to push things further in this scholastic direction. It is as if the ritualized monastic hold on the self is simply too strong to yield quickly to the fresh look of therapy or self-betterment. It is ironic that Adler's ethics is not about knowledge of self in a way that we would recognize as Augustinian introspection today. Instead, it um, uh, tries to lay down formal rules for scrutinizing one's mind with a rigidity as if oneself were interchangeable with the self of another, the way that Adler also conceived himself as Peter. This kind of formal introspection is very similar to the way in which early medieval authors, starting with Augustine's famous analysis in Book One of the City of God, um, and ranging until and beyond Adelar, were used to identify suicide with homicide. Ethics, even when presented as being of a more introspective kind, coincides in the end with moral epistemology for Adelar whereby it little matters, at least so it seems, whether this epistemology concerns knowledge of self or knowledge of others. True self-reflection, the kind that would coincide with a desire for therapy in the modern sense, is left out of the equation. How then are we to interpret this, and what is the relation with Augustine? From a Christian theological perspective, it's tempting to circumvent problems here by reverting all knowledge simply back to its found, that is, the divine trinity, with the argument that for medieval thinkers, all knowledge naturally had to culminate in knowledge of God. True enough, for so it did, 
but at the same time a perplexing problem presenting itself more prominently in our post-enlightenment, post-modern age, is that we're not so certain what knowledge of God really meant for them. <coughs> Although on the surface the goal of medical Christian culture is to reach knowledge of the triune God, and this goal may well be seen as setting them apart from Nussbaum's Hellenistic philosophers, it remains an open question whether in the case of Adler's ethics this stated goal provides the answer to his introspective quest, or whether it is what brings on the drive for introspection in the first place. This is precisely the ambiguity inherent in the tropological turn of the early Middle Ages. It is premised on the idea that God and the soul are somehow joined in a mutual embrace that falls neither under, desire, under the desire for therapy nor under the therapy of desire, as in it, desire and therapy ultimately somehow converge in a kind of singular, circular ambulation. And now I come to a section on the open self, the ethics of order between Augustine and Adeline. What then can we say about the early medieval period prior to Adeline? The theology of the period is mostly characterized as monastic on the one hand and platonic on the other. Scholars, including myself, I must admit, have so far rarely elaborated on the connection between the two. The relationship between Augustine, John Scottus Eugena, and Anselm may serve as a pertinent illustration. While the ties between Augustine and Anselm are clear, they apply to two relatively distinct areas. There's the matter of a shared affective vocabulary, which comes out especially in Anselm's prayers, and the epistemological device of illumination on the other hand, uh, as comes out in the Postlogion. But despite standard observations relating their intimate bond, there has been no structural exploration of this connection. The ties between Augustine and Eugenia are on the whole more formally portrayed. Augustine is among Eugenia's most quoted authority, which accords with his general platonic mindset, but scholarly consensus has it that Eugenia's interest lies rather with the Platonism of Eastern theology. A further difficulty here is that since Eugenia himself was keenly aware of the divergence of his Eastern and Western sources, he took the necessary precautions to integrate them. With Augustine and Pseudo-Dionysius never contradicting each other in his main work, the Perifusion, it is not so easy to prove that he prefers the East actually to the West. The ties between Eugenia and Anselm, finally, have not been explored, although it should not be difficult to achieve scholarly agreement on the point of their shared platonic outlook. This would seem to make the case for a possible structural connection even stronger, perhaps, than between Augustine and Anselm. I'm thinking here especially of the relationship between the subtle phrasing and asymptotic throne of Anselm's ontological argument and their mutual experimental play and my own um, view about the tropological turn of the early Middle Ages. 
For it seems we may be able to push things further by extrapolating from the success of Nussbaum's therapy of desire and conclude that perhaps what I've called the tropological turn here has not yet been duly appreciated and hence also not exhaustively investigated because it has, it has fallen victim to its own overwhelming success story. We may call this in shorthand perhaps the success story of Western monasticism and spirituality. For the case can be made that Jean Leclerc's seminal love of learning and the desire for God has served as a kind of spiritual alternative to Nussbaum's therapeutical key as she set out to unlock the secrets of Hellenistic philosophy. Looking back to the early medieval period from Abelard's 12th century position and seeing the latter indeed as an attempt to arrive at a deeper and more personal sense of ethical, ethical scrutiny, one can argue that the importance of the introspective self in the early Middle Ages in a Leclercian sense has been overstated at the expense of its more ritual, monastic embeddedness. One could then push further still by arguing that this very monastic embeddedness has itself in turn been isolated artificially from the cosmic order in which it was held and which encompassed both the monastery and the self. The relevance of this remark is not to point out the need to see things in their proper proportions, although that is essential for the integral discourse of early medieval thought, but rather to acknowledge the fact that in early medieval theology, the notion of order and balance is always implied to the point of forming in stacid substrate. It literally makes no difference whether we are dealing with the platonic notion of cosmic return in Eriugena or with Anselm's intimate prayer that God may reform his defiled soul in the opening chapter of the Coslogio. It is my contention that the divergence of these two, meaning the soul of self and the idea of cosmic nature, is from an early medieval perspective ultimately a matter of optical illusion. They inevitably come together because they jointly constitute the regimen of divine order which serves both as the linchpin and the substrate of early medieval reflection. Originating in Augustine's notion of confession, where they were firmly united, they mutated to form a distinctive self-propelling discourse in the early Middle Ages, whose prime characteristic is that it is always about itself, rather than about the self in the individualized manner that would gain currency only after the 12th century. That is why I prefer to speak of a tropological self for this period, as it is by involving oneself in the task of biblical hermeneutics that the self explores the universe and reaches out for God without ever truly accomplishing both. It seems fitting to speak about an early medieval ethics of order because it is in this notion of order that God and the self um, come together to the point of enabling humans to make responsible choices. The choices made under such a holistic worldview are necessarily the choices of an open self, as both the monastery and the cosmos served as dynamic extension of, uh, the dynamic extensions of, rather than fixed loci for the self. They are ethical choices because contrary to appearances, the early medieval sense of order never describes a stagnant metaphysical situation in which a sinful human lies prostrate before an omnipotent God, but aims precisely at facilitating traffic to the extent that under the direction of recta ratio, a term used by Eriuchen and also actually by uh, Anselm, the soul, the God, the soul, the self, and the universe should eventually flow back into the same reality unbroken by hierarchy from which they originated. But while this is the long-term goal of early medieval thought, the notion of order also signifies that human beings ought to be able to think about reality and live their life in such a way that the forces of evil are held at bay. They do so not by dispelling it, as a simplified version of the penitential theory behind monastic prayer would have it, 
but by integrating it into a larger fabric with fluid boundaries between self and cosmos, trying to educate themselves while banishing evil from their souls. While there certainly is a therapeutical aspect to this process, it does not center around the patient self-medicating himself through a process of mobilizing, mobilizing the forces of desire. Instead, what is significant about the early medieval <coughs> tradition is that in it, the remedy for sin and the antidote for the tedium of a life in flux become fully collapsed so as to be indistinguishable. As an example, we may look to a passage from Eugenius Perifusion, 5959b, towards the very end, in which to achieve the final return, um, in order to, to achieve the final return, he promotes the study of creation as a way to educate human nature, and I quote, for in this manner of spiritual medicine, God wanted to pull back his image, that is man, both onto itself and onto him, so that, fatigued and trained by the tedium of mutable things, it would desire to contemplate the stability of immutable and eternal things, would ardently hunger for the incommutable forms of through things, so as to rest in their beauty without any variety." End of quote. In this passage, God, the self and the cosmos, hold each other in such a tight embrace that ultimately it's not clear who's holding whom. This is precisely what marks the complexity inherent in the early medieval ethics of order, as the order encroaches on the final goal so as to make reaching it almost redundant. And now I come to my conclusion, the early medieval ethics of order as an Augustinian construct. It's well known that when in the 4th century, Jerome decided to withdraw in the Palestinian desert to lead an ascetic Christian life, this arch erudite had great difficulty in parting with his books. <laughs> in a famous dream which plays out this tension, he externalizes his self-doubt by presenting us with contrasting views of himself. You are not a Christian, you are a Ciceronian is the divine verdict that is passed. According to the letter, he writes about this to Eustochium, a virgin who herself contemplated an ascetic future and could use his advice. Jerome's dream with a visit by the devil, the fact that he shares this with a prospective ascetic in a letter, it could all qualify as therapy of desire. Jerome learns to control his scholastic desires according to what one may call a strategy of sublimation. The kind of literature that follows from this qualifies indeed as a therapeutical, in the way of Hellenistic, uh, indeed as a kind of therapy of desire, but it's not yet introspective in a trapological sense, nor is it therapeutical in the way of Hellenistic philosophy. On the heels of Jerome, it seems the standard approach to such questions of desire in the early Middle Ages would be mostly through the use of narrative rather than the exercise of philosophy. Fittingly, Jerome is also the author of the first life of a Latin saint, namely the life of St. Paul, not the apostle, but a mythical forerunner of Antony in the desert, as he wanted to compete against the East by claiming the birth of asceticism for the West. <laughs> this kind of hagiographical literature definitely has moral overtones, as is made clear in either the wisdom of saints and postmodernism, in which he wants to give saints' lives a new reading. Instead of being dismissed as samples of casual storytelling, they should be newly scrutinized as persistent and programmatic calls to moral action. They are perhaps not self-help, but they're certainly help books, allowing medieval readers to model the kind of Christian life they want to lead according to their favorite saints. What I've tried to argue here, however, is that the more obvious kind of self-help text that we find in the early Middle Ages, including monastic prayers, may not be so introspective and therapeutical as has often been thought. That they are regarded as such is understandable, given their profound sense of devotion 
whose intensity set against the backdrop of a secular world makes them into spiritual icons, revered as representations of a spiritual reality that is now lost. But just as the existence of 17th century Dutch still life paintings do not thereby accurately <coughs> portray the Edwards Dust household of that period, adding much by way of the painter's technique and personal vision, in the same way, the monastic and cosmic text of the early Middle Ages ought not to be too easily seen as capturing the general spirituality of the age. In that sense, the success of Leclerc's love of learning and desire for God has been too overwhelming, perhaps, blocking out other avenues of research that are much in need of exploration. So what does it mean to settle on the occurrence of a kind of topological term towards an open self, as typical for the early medieval ethical mindset? Something along the lines of what Nussbaum discusses in her Therapy of Designer may have played a role in the background of the formation of Christian texts discussed here, but I would stretch the discussion more to accommodate a dose notion of knowledge as a way of life. Historically, however, I would argue that this ethics of order begins with Augustine. Hence, I advocate me to study Augustine also from what his early medieval successors took from him, for there's much to be gained if we investigate his work from the angle of its moral intellectual fiber. Rather than looking at Augustine from a biographical perspective, as is very uh, common uh, in the 20th century, as he develops from an ascetic Neoplatonic thinker into a mature, deeply Christian mind, the different encapsulated in the contrast between the early soliloquies and the autobiographical confessions, it seems that by reasoning back from the early medieval perception of Augustine, we may get a more coherent picture of their connection, thereby adding to a deeper understanding of the intellectual integrity of his oeuvre. A layered notion of confession, opening up into the self as much as into the universe, that is the substrate of Augustine's ethics of order, and that is the message he bequeathed to the early Middle Ages. Notwithstanding his development, it seems to have mattered very little to him whether he played that out via a more platonic and cosmological program, as in his early work, De Ordine on Order, in a prayerful confessions, or in a biblically-centered work like on Christian doctrine. It is not in a selective, but in a mixed and integrative way that Augustine was transmitted into the Middle Ages, with early medieval authors seeing the mix as the essence of his message. It is as if by bracketing the psychological notion of time, causing the human alienation of the existential <coughs> anime, to which today we've become so sensitive, early medieval authors attempted to capture and conserve how underneath that Augustine has engraved his confession of God on the order of nature as an eternal but no less redemptive whole. Let me end with a quotation from Confessions 1334 that captures the early medieval spirit perfectly, in my opinion, not as the eternity before time, but of eternity as the only fitting lens through which to contemplate reality itself. And I quote, I've also considered what spiritual truths you intended to be expressed by the order in which the world was created, and the order in which the creation is described. I've seen that while each single one of your works is good, collectively they are very good, and that heaven and earth, which represent the head and the body of the church, were predestined in your word, that is, in your only begotten Son, before all time began, when there was no morning and no evening. Thank you.
that I'm just a Gothic, and, and I saw Gregory and also with the influence of Origen as, as um, a, a different sort of stream of thought that went into the West. I now tend to think that Augustine Samba how is even behind Gregory also. And um, there is that sense of early medieval reflection as being about itself, that kind of self-propelling motion that makes for these very long and winding texts that I think is somehow coming out of Augustine's what I've been called ethics of order, and you can also link to Gregory. Yeah. So I, I tend to see now more of a connection between <coughs> Augustine and Gregory than I used to. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.